if you get your views from television news you'll only hear stories that corporations choose you'll only get to see what they want you to see you're gonna have to read and decide what you believe we all watched in horror 911 the planes hit the towers and the towers came down did you ever wonder how they fell so fast well maybe that's a question that we're not supposed to ask don't you think it's strange there were no fighter jets did someone give the order not to intercept and if they really scrambled then why'd they fly so slow maybe there's an answer that we don't want to know and where was our president George W that fool he was visiting with children at an elementary school and when he heard the news he didn't seem concerned he just calmly read a picture book while all those people burned howdy welcome to I guess it's season four, episode nine, April 16th. Well, a lot has been happening over the past few weeks, and I wish I had like a three hour show to put in. I'm gonna go over a lot of things very fast. The number one thing is what's going on in Egypt right now. Remember how we had the uh, definition of Al Qaeda and told you how it's being used? Well, uh, we're gonna play a, a CNN clip where uh, uh, a CIA agent, ex-CIA agent, Scherer, kind of lessens her in the, uh, well, he doesn't use Al-Qaeda, but you'll, you'll hear it. He uses the Muhad, Muhajadim, ex-Muhajadim. So go ahead and roll it. Now, help for Libyan rebels from the CIA. President Obama reportedly signing off on this. Sources say CIA operatives are on the ground in Libya and in contact with the opposition. And joining us to talk more about the CIA's possible role in Libya from Washington, former CIA counterterrorism analyst Michael Scheuer. Michael, thanks for being with us this morning. You're welcome. So there are reports out, again, that the CIA is on the ground in Libya, uh, contacting and vetting the rebels. Is this setting the stage to arm them? I, I don't think there's any other uh, possible reason for it. And, and uh, the president clearly has sent the agency in to find out who he is supporting and to see what kind of material, uh, human material, we would have to work with if we decided to, if the president decided to arm and train these people over the longer term. Yeah, and you're concerned about this prospect. You think it could become another Taliban situation for the U.S. What, in your mind, is the worst case scenario here? Well, uh, Libya has been very strong in sending young men or having its young men go overseas to fight in Islamic insurgencies in the Balkans, in Chechnya, Afghanistan, especially Iraq, when the, the height of the fighting was there. Those that don't get killed, of course, go home. And I think the core of the resistance, whatever little military, military ability they have, is probably made up by people we, elsewhere we would call mujahideen. And so it's a, it's a dicey proposition to be getting involved with this. I'm not sure that 
uh, the opposition, if it takes power, is going to be much better than was Gaddafi. But that's why you need to have the CIA, I presume, in there vetting, as we said, who, who are these people, who are the elements that are funding them or supporting them, who are the, the politically the most, uh, the most palatable and the least palatable among them. The White House saying that no decision has been made. I have a question for you as a, as a CIA veteran, I guess. I mean, the fact that we even know about this is that is that unusual? I mean, should we just assume that the CIA in this sort of a situation would, of course, be in there on the ground? Well, it, it, you have to assume that the president wants the best information that he can get. And if he wants to have that information, he has to have somebody on the ground. And so, yes, I think you assume wherever there's trouble, you'll find the agency. Uh, the other point I would make here is that vetting the people who are in the opposition of course is only uh, you're only able to do that to the extent that they're willing to talk to you I think the agency will find a lot of people who are pro-democracy and and westernized happy to talk to them the the more Islamic oriented people aren't going to talk to them because that would bring into question our air support for them so uh, it, this is a this is a mission that's a very difficult one and the chances of success are really uh, probably not better than 50-50. What's the alternative um, if we don't arm the rebels and they're clearly outmanned and outgunned by uh, Qaddafi's forces? Um, what's the better solution here? The better solution was, as Mr. Paul said, never go at all. This was none of our business. But I think what we're seeing is the string is playing out. We threatened Qaddafi and that didn't work. There's an arms embargo and an economic embargo. That didn't work. There was a UN resolution and that didn't work. Aerial bombing has continued and has impact, but it hasn't defeated him. Now we're at the stage where we're going to try to, apparently, try to train and arm the resistance. That takes a long time. I don't know if we have that time against Gaddafi. What, what we're seeing is the president being put, putting himself into a corner where his only option is ground troops. But that's something that is not, that's not something that no one says that they want to do in this administration. I mean, they, they simply don't want to do that. They want Well, to they don't. Well, the, the, the choice may come down to admitting that it was a mistake and being defeated in the sense that Gaddafi survives or putting ground troops in. Nations are a lot like people. They don't like making, uh, admitting to mistakes. And uh, maybe they don't want to put them in. But when it comes down to looking defeat in the face, I wonder. You know, you led the CIA's unit that tracked Osama bin Laden 1996 to 1999, and you believe that, uh, much like that situation, America's involvement in Libya could prove to be a recruiting tool for extremists. Why? Oh, oh it's absolutely a recruiting tool. It's, it's the American-led West attacking a Muslim country that has oil. They've been oil. very careful to say it's not the American-led West, that NATO has now fully taken over the operations. Um, uh, well, that may fool... Firepower was used in the beginning, but that this is uh, a coalition that includes Arab states. That may fool some Americans. Uh, it's not going to fool the people who sympathize with bin Laden and other Islamists. This is really a U.S.-led operation. And you talk about the Arab states that are involved. The Arab states are tyrannies that are hated by their own people. This is, a, this is a piece of theater set up by Mrs. Clinton and Mrs. Mr. McCain and the, the bipartisan group that loves to intervene abroad. In the Muslim world, this is Americans killing Muslims again, and it looks like it's for oil. I, I, I just want to ask, are you trying to have it both ways and saying that, okay, these are tyrannies that hate their own people? Well, that's why we're helping, because in Libya, it was the people that wanted Gaddafi out, that they were tired of it. So weren't we then supporting uh, Islamic democracy, I guess you could say, in these countries where they're tired of totalitarian rule? If we were supporting Islamic democracy, that would be one thing. But if you listen to Mrs. Clinton and especially the rather crazed Miss Rice at the UN, this is all about democracy in a world where, where democracy is not going to take hold. I think it's very clear, Michael Scheuer, that you are no fan of this policy and this administration. I, I think calling uh, Ambassador Rice crazed is, is certainly a, 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 a significant charge. Um, well, I don't know. I've just listened to her. You know, that's only my impression. And I have to say, this is not a Democratic problem. This is a Republican problem, too. Both parties love to intervene in other people's business where there are no U.S. interests at stake and where we spend enormous amounts of money at a time when we're nearly bankrupt. That doesn't seem to me to be a wise practice of American and statesmanship. That's, and that's a whole other story. That it, we, it, it, to call the United States bankrupt, the United States is running humongous deficits, yes, but the economy and this mission in Libya are two separate 
issues. She's They're not separate him issues, ma'am. Quick. You're just carrying the water for Mr. Obama. I'm Ooh. certainly not carrying anyone's water, and and that and I, I will assure you of that. She Michael Schroeder, thank you now. so much for your time. Um, we you know we've had a very long, exhaustive interview. You had plenty of time to give your point of view on that. Uh, yeah, we're gonna be plenty of time to give your point of view. Thanks, Michael. Bye. Yeah, there you go. It's it's one of those things. Uh, he started saying too much truth. But did you notice that he didn't call them Al-Qaeda? He called them ex muhajideen Those are the uh, fighters that we put against the Russians or, you know, we kept giving them weapons and money. And now we're doing the same thing in Libya. But the thing is, that in the meantime, we've blamed them for 9-11. And so now we've got the touchy uh, political situation of, you know, wanting to support these so-called rebels. But at the same time, we're supposed to be arresting them and, and prosecuting them for the heinous crime of 9-11. What do you think is wrong with our government for uh, mi missing that disconnect there? Okay, well, we're going to play this next cut. This is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is in the news. Attorney General Eric Holder announced today that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and other alleged 9-11 terrorists will be tried before military commissions at Guantanamo Bay. That's instead of receiving trials within the U.S. federal court system. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and four others who are being held at Gitmo are facing charges of participating in the 9-11 plot. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed being the alleged mastermind. Now, the move is a sharp reversal and defeat for the Obama administration, which last year said that they wanted these alleged terrorists to have civilian trials in federal courts, with KSM's trial slated to take place in New York City. But their decision to try KSM in New York set off quite the political firestorm. Even though civilian trials have a much higher success rate as opposed to military commissions, which have been mired in controversy and are relatively new, Republican and Democratic leaders and members of the New York congressional delegation all came out against the plan. They cited cost and security concerns over the trials being held in Manhattan. Some also argue that the suspects who are not American citizens should not receive the rights and protections provided to defendants in civil courts. Now, Congress, under the control of Democrats, balked at the idea and moved swiftly to cut off funding for the civilian trial. So today, Holder defended his original plan and blamed Congress for intervening and cutting off the funding for those domestic trials. Now, sadly, this is yet another sign that Obama simply will not be able to deliver on his promise to shut down the Guantanamo Bay facility or to pursue his agenda of civilian trials for accused terrorists. Although in the past, he was the candidate that said that our justice system, our courts are something to be proud of rather than an ad hoc approach to justice. But don't forget, last week's ruling in a federal appeals court that said that a Yemeni detainee couldn't be released even though there was no evidence that he had worked with or been a member of al-Qaeda, simply that he was in the same area as them. So how anybody could argue that civilian trials are less harsh on detainees after that ruling makes absolutely no sense to me. But I guess the larger point that we can take away from all this is that Gitmo is not going anywhere anytime soon. And that's sad. Yeah. Gitmo's not going anywhere, anywhere near soon. <laughs> well, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Remember in 2009, November 2009, when they first announced that he would have a, what, they called it a civilian trial. I call it a fair trial. Not that it would have been, but it would have been more likely to be fair than the military tribunal. Uh, but let's go back and see. I cut some clips out of that, out of a one of my shows back then, so you can see what I said at the time. So let's see how it matches up with history today. Was my prediction right? Go ahead and. Watch. But this kind of brings us to a current event, and I'm going to get to some other stuff later. But this current event is about the 9/11 mastermind going on trial in New York, and everybody is raising such a ruckus this falls in the same category if we are going to go and invade country after country after country saying we're bringing democracy to the world i mean that just it, oh it burns my ears to hear us say that and then we don't want to use it when it comes to a, the biggest trial we, supposedly we of the use century our, blah 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 well court system the, the Republicans and whatnot are saying, it's oh, it's going to endanger us. Oh, we can't, we can't give them fairness. We can't give them a fair trial 
because we've already convicted them. Oh, that's not what they said. That's just paraphrasing. We can't give them a fair trial because if we did, we might have to release some of them. As a matter of fact, if you give them a fair trial, you'd have to release all of them, probably. If the only way that those guys are guilty is guilty like Oswald was guilty. And you notice Oswald didn't get to trial either. Well, I'm making a prediction right now. We're real close to the trial. There isn't going to be one. I don't believe there's going to be one. I could be wrong. But the 9-11 myth, the government story, the, the official story, the lie about 9-11 depends on nobody examining the evidence. So you can't have a trial with evidence presented. What that means is that either they're going to somehow find a way to execute him or maybe have him die in a terrorist attack, another terrorist attack maybe, huh? another 9-11 style false flag terrorist attack, and he happens to die in it. But more likely, he'll make a plea bargain. But my bet is that there will be no trial with evidence presented. It'll be a bargain behind closed doors. And, uh, well, I guess with that, let's open up the phone lines and see what people have to say. I'm going to give Number two, I'm going to take you up on your, your uh, uh, semi-wager there uh, that uh, the trial uh, um, will not happen, uh, uh, I believe. A my bit first... I'll I, bet you your choice is soda pop. One can. Yeah, my my personal opinion on this matter is that the uh, trial may begin. However, uh, somewhere along the line, something is going to happen to cause a mistrial, uh, whether it's uh, the prosecution's mistake or uh, maybe the jury will be. He basically is saying the same thing. I said a new trial. Well, it, uh, it, somehow this thing will go completely into the mud. And, and turn it into a fiasco. Yeah, that's uh, kind of what I was thinking. That, it w But a lot, there won't be any evidence because they, right. they don't dare pre let evidence into the trial because oh. once they look at evidence, they, the whole thing is blown. Oh, heck, yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. If, if uh, defense demands the entire, uh, uh, all the evidence, uh, uh, there will be at some point somebody saying, oh, no, well, this is a state secret. You can't have this. You can't have that. But anyway... That's my opinion, that the trial may begin, right on. Uh, but it will uh, uh, wind up in the mud, upside down. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, thanks, Bill. He wound okay, up agreeing with calling. me. Call back again. For betting against and me, he agreed with me. On. Okay, we're going to have one more cut here, right into it. Oh, I, I guess one of the things that I wanted to say about the, uh, the naysayers, talking about the 9-11 trial that's coming up and how it should have been a military tribunal. Turned out it is. The fact of the matter is that we violated every norm that's been established both by treaty and international law and our own laws. At least six of our own laws are against torture, not just, you know, some treaty that we signed. So the people that say, well, we shouldn't be listening to treaties. Treaties are the law of the land according to the Constitution, which, you know, some of these people that don't like treaties at the same time claim to uphold the Constitution, but apparently they haven't read it. But anyway, uh, without a treaty, we still have at least six different laws against the type of torture that we were performing. And to have the Republicans in, in, in mass come out and talk about how we're endangered and how all this stuff, you know, they're either liars or they're incredibly stupid. There is no in-between ground. And, you know, everything you've ever been taught about your country, we're supposed to give people their day in court, not after you torture them for five or six years, their day in court on a sensitive, timely manner, and they're supposed to be able to confront their witnesses, and we never saw any of that with any of the things that are going on. The military tribunals start out assuming guilt, and that's what these guys are doing. They're, what did Obama say? We'll give him a trial, or some, I don't know if it was Obama, but it was somebody in his administration probably the attorney general saying we'll give him a trial we'll convict him and then we'll hang him well now wait a minute if if you actually give the guy a trial you might have to release him and you know if he gets released that's justice that's not justice evaded that would be justice nobody in afghanistan none of these guys that are about to be tried are capable of 
putting explosives in all three trade center buildings under the eyes of all those, you know, secret service organizations. So, bottom line, well, do we really stand f for the letter of law? Or do we want to be just like these terrorists? I think we so just proved of? that by turning it into be a very tribunal. Afraid, and since you're afraid, we're going to start acting just like the terrorists. We're going to blow up innocent people in all kinds of countries. We're going to invade a country with no reason and do a shock and awe, completely destroying every bit of the country's history and infrastructure and art. And we're going to say that we're restoring democracy. And then we're going to, out of the other side of our mouths, we're going to talk about being afraid of terrorism. You know, I'm sick of the lies. Watch us next December 5th. Well, okay. Sorry about all the dark. I didn't do a very good job of editing that. But, you know, while I'm on the subject, uh, go ahead and roll the next clip, clip six there. This this is one. What I wanted to remind you. Yeah. Uh, by Professor. Go ahead. No, not that one. Six. What I wanted to remind yeah. people of was that, you know, they're talking about Obama bringing change. He's going to be the next president of the United States. I think that's pretty clear now, without having the Republicans go full bore cheat on the elections like the last few. If you don't realize that, read or check with Greg Palast on the elections, and you'll find out how they've been cheated. But... What change is Obama talking about, and what change are you Obama supporters expecting? Because if you're expecting us to get out of Iraq, you're out of luck. Obama's an imperialist, and his his uh, advisors are neocons. Zbigniew Brzezinski. Uh, what it boils down to is, with Michelle Obama, an active participating member of the Council on Foreign Relations, you're not going to see a policy change. Remember, the Council on Foreign Relations are, is the group that sets policy for the United States. They're the part of the puppet master group, and with Obama's wife being a member of that group, there's a whole bunch of brain-dead meadow muffins out there yelling, we're going to have change, we're going to have change. Every time we have eight years of bullshit from one of these groups, they set up the other group to take over. I mean, it was obvious over a year ago when McCain was running, I said, are, the Republicans aren't stupid, so why are they deliberately running somebody that's going to lose? I mean, that couldn't have been obvious, more obvious. So it boils down to why on earth do you expect something to be different if we just re-elect the same people? The Democrats were instrumental in this economic collapse. The Democrats were instrumental in our invasion of two sovereign countries. The Democrats were instrumental in the stripping of, of our rights. And we all blame it on the Republicans. And we talk about, oh, everything's going to change now that we're going to get the Democrats in. Horseshit. That's just the other branch of the same party, the property party. And it's not your property. that they're Well, they want your property, but the only property they care about Okay. Uh, well, I, I, I guess Neil I. Parrott. Go ahead. Yeah, I. I got a little carried away with my uh, vernacular there, but you know, with any luck, uh, we won't have too many objections. The. Uh, I just had to to get a I told you so in there about both Khalid Sheikh Oswald. I mean Khalid Sheikh uh, Mohammed, and. Uh, Obama, McCain, whatever his name was, I can't remember. Oh yeah, Barack Obama. He's from he's from Hawaii, I believe, isn't he? Yeah, maybe that's why everybody's so upset because you know it, it's only been a few decades or what, almost a hundred years since we stole that from the Hawaiians. Well, I don't know. I'm going off on a tangent. Anyway, okay. Um, now the, the next cut we're going to do. I'm going to skip the the cut number seven and go to cut number eight and I, I'm sorry I don't have the name of the lady that that has her back to us but she's a PhD in psychology and and several other you know uh, certifications and uh, 
she's with a group of scientists, including Niels Herrett, and they're up in Edmonton, Canada. I think it's Edmonton. I I really did this at the last minute, and I didn't get my notes down. And uh, but that's where you and the internet come in. You go looking for Niels Herrett and these uh, Canadian uh, college professors discussing 9/11 and how to analyze it and how to uh, further the 9/11 Truth movement. So she puts in some interesting uh, ideas that. You know, we don't get much input, you know, about psychological uh, aspects of 9-11. So this will be a really good one. So this is a, about nine minutes, but I, and I'll try to adjust the sound so you can hear it really well. But anyway, go for it. This is a good one. And the more that you relate, the, the um, planes going to the towers, the towers come down, and for weeks after 9-11, that was re repeatedly shown on television. And from a behavioralist point of view, this is basic, this is basic classic conditioned behavior, uh, classically conditioned fear. And what happens is that that arouses um, a significant amount of anxiety in people. And as soon as they're reminded of 9-11, that they actually have a physiological response of anxiety, and it makes it very difficult for them to process any other information. And um, um, what I was thinking about was when uh, Professor Hart was showing the images of people sitting and watching an actual controlled demolition. They know it's a controlled demolition. So we have an audience where, you know, this is a very interesting thing to watch a building come down. and. The, the one thing I noticed in all the video clips is that the people scream. They know it's controlled demolition, they know exactly what's going to happen, but they still scream. So this is a visceral reaction to destruction that people have. Now can you imagine not expecting those towers to collapse, and then it collapsed, that that amount of visceral reaction to destruction, and it's basically classically conditioned fear, and then along with the idea that, oh, it was Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. Those two are just linked in people's brains. And at some point, it actually gets hardwired into your brain. Now let's uh, talk through some of the psychology of those towers fall. So we just heard um, Professor Niels Herrick tell us that in his view, the debate is more or less uh, over that it was controlled demolition for all three towers. And controlled demolition, of course, has to be set up prior to the planes going into the building. So once you have to grapple with that idea, explosives were in those buildings, and this was pre-planned, then you have to say, well, why would somebody do that? And you start to conjure up with this terrible concept that some psychological experts we're able to say if we bring those towers down on live television and the whole world is watching and and people see thousands of people being murdered in cold blood and, and those towers have a certain you know they're not just any towers they're they're symbols of, a, of commercial might they're symbols of, of, a, of a way of life uh, they're symbols of you know, attitudes and worldviews that some psychological experts were calculating, well, if that takes place, people will be so traumatized, they'll be so disoriented, they'll be so shaken to their core that it will give a license to do, for instance, an invasion of Afghanistan, which clearly was well planned before. You know, it happened so quickly, the Patriot Act came in in just a matter of days. I mean, there's all of these things that quite clearly would take a lot of time to do, like the Patriot Act is thousands of pages. Mm -hmm. You don't just sort of stay up a couple of nights late and quickly draft that. So, you know, once you start to conjure with the idea, could it be that somewhere in the system, you know, a country that did Hollywood, a country that did, you know, Edward Bernays, that, that uh, studies public opinion and public perception, a country where you realize that you know to sell wars, like you can sell toothpaste, you can sell presidents. Uh, how do you sell a war? How do you how do you twist public opinion to support invasions and murders of of, of entire populations and and torture? How do you how do you get people in a frame of mind where they will, will accept that? And and it becomes really a, a shocking. Uh, it's just it's just. It, it, 
it's so terrible to consider that you know was was this is this a psychological operation and if so what are what are those experts in psychology those high uh, highly trained highly educated people who understand how you twist perceptions how how can the psychologist as a profession you know, deal with that possibility that, that this is a psychological operation. Surprisingly, they're just like everybody else. They have their limits of critical analysis. Um, I found it very interesting that one of the theories I do talk about in my paper is terror management theory. And it which is a terrifying which, phrase in its own Yeah, language. yeah, it's called terror management terror theory. Terror management theory. Mm -hmm. And it basically is based on the idea that um, the, okay, people have belief systems and worldviews, and they protect them from an inevitability, like the, the realization that they're going to die. And religion is one of the biggest ones. It, it promises literal life after death. Okay? Now, other institutions, more secular institutions, promise um, symbolic um, life, after, like symbolic immortality such as belief in democracy, your nationalism, your political ideology, maybe even uh, fields such as science or history or geography or something like this. So there's symbolic immortality as well. And um, so right after 9-11, terror management theory really took off. And Greenberg, Solomon, and Kaczynski have done um, many studies, and a lot of researchers have joined in this field, looking at specifically at the effects of 9-11 on the American population and on populations around the world. But what they have not done is looked at um, how that applies to questioning the official account. They haven't done it. Um, I tried to do that in my paper in The American Behavioral Scientist. But they haven't done that. Now you're asking about psychologists knowing about some of this information prior to these events occurring. Well, surprisingly enough, terror management theory has been around for 20 or 30 years. It's nothing that's new. Um, they began this theory as graduate students. They've been publishing research ever since on this. And it basically goes around the fact that we remind people of their death, which is called mortality salience that they have anxiety that's aroused, and in order to deal with that anxiety, they bolster whatever worldview they already believe in. So if you have a society that's very largely patriotic already, that's exactly what they are going to bolster their beliefs in. And there's actually quite a bit of evidence that um, in the months after 9-11, that public support for foreign policymakers almost doubled. And this was, a, this was from a low of 30% right before the attacks, doubling to almost 60%. And the main question was, do you or do you not have trust in your um, public officials to do the right thing? And right after 9-11, it jumped up to over 60%. So right there, people are looking for someone to protect them and to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. And they just basically turn over all their rights to this. And of course, there are people in the field that a psychologist that would have known this and would have predicted this. Um, something else that I find that's really important is um, Science, the Journal of Science just came out in February with an article and it's called Defeating Creation, Creationism in the Courtroom but Not in the Classroom. And the article is about the lack of science education in high school and at university and that most students do not have the proper foundation to look at things from a scientific point of view and to critically consider evidence. And there are even teachers saying things like, I don't teach a theory of evolution um, or the Big Bang because we just don't have proof that it's reliable science or that they think that students should be able to just um, think about something and come up with their own conclusion without going through a rigorous scientific method. And so if you have um, a population that I think it's like something like 40 or 50 percent actually reject the scientific principles of evolution because it conflicts with their religious beliefs in a deity, that that is very telling and it's very important because they're also rejecting scientific principles of physics that basically say that a building that comes down in three falls speed has to um, have been done by controlled demolition. But wait a minute, we have a belief that our government could never be involved in something like this, or like that's the implication, right? That somebody else was involved. So that supersedes everything else, so we have to um, put up all kinds of factors and 
and studies and all kinds of resistance to just block that out. And, it, it, and it, I find a parallel between that and the creationists trying to bring pseudoscientific evidence into the classroom, very similar. Okay, I, I find that, you know, when I'm going to these various debunker uh, video websites or whatever and then leaving messages and and going back and forth with the so-called debunkers, uh, I get the worst examples of, well, the best examples of pseudoscience, but the worst examples of, of logic and debate skills that you've ever wanted to see. Um, but did you catch what she said about terror management? Yeah, that's, that's a, <laughs> a bona fide study, especially in the, uh, you know, military circles. That's another word for it is, uh, you know, how to create your own false flag event, terror management. You're not managing unknown terror, you're, you're creating the terror. That's the management you're talking about. Now, um, these guys are all sitting around. Oh, I wanted to say, you see right behind me here that we've got a kind of a chart. Now, how many times if you, if you take a look, you see where it says Pacifica, there's Soros, and right down below there it says Pacifica, and right below that it says Democracy Now! and Amy Goodman. Well, other places on this chart it shows other left, left uh, news sources like Mother Jones and uh, The Nation magazine and Bill Moyers and so on. But this shows the funding for Pacifica it comes from Soros, the, the big left-wing millionaire, billionaire, whatever, uh, from the Carnegie Corporation, from the Ford Foundation, and from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Every one of those is a big, uh, powerful corporation with, you know, definitely uh, wanting to stay away from 9-11. And that's why, you know, for fear of losing their funding, the democracy now stays away from 9-11. That's, that's the only thing I can guess. Well, they stay away from anything that the people on the top row don't want to have public. Uh, you can get this by going to questionsquestions.net forward slash gatekeepers.html. Okay, you get that? Questionsquestions.net forward slash gatekeepers.html and you'll be able to find it just by saying gatekeeper chart or something like that. Well, now those professors that we were just seeing a minute ago, including Niels Herrett, he's the one in the back, um, were discussing all kinds of aspects of 9-11. This is almost a two, two hours plus, I think, is the total video. Um, and I only cut snippets out here and there. And uh, they got to analyzing things in terms of this country and that country, this border, that border. And Niels Herrett kind of said, hey, wait a minute. I don't think you should analyze them from, you know, these vertical boundaries like states and borders and whatnot. You should be analyzing it horizontally from, you know, economic levels, the poor on the bottom, the rich on the top. And... Uh, then they go on into talking about, you know, well, how should they get an investigation going when the people that are supposed to be doing the investigation are the authorities and they're not going to? Um, one of their suggestions was that maybe college professors and college institutions, universities, have a um, an inherent obligation to to follow up on 9/11. So anyway, we're going to, I'll play what they said here. It's a 10 minute clip and uh, they start out talking about the vertical versus horizontal. That he would like to respond? Yeah, just a little comment. I think that when we are rationalizing the global situation these days along vertical fractures and vertical front lines, uh, we are making a mistake. We should not talk about different ethnic groups or different religious groups, nor different nationalities, because this is what they want us to do. They want us to have discussions between Muslims and Christians. Who is they? Who are they? Yeah, who are they? I'll not go into that. But this is, and they're setting up uh, sports games between countries 
to draw attention to these, what in my opinion, artificial frontiers and fractures, which I characterize as vertical. The real frontiers are between front, a top, and bottom, and they're horizontal. And such a thing as intelligence is not a national affair, it's a global thing. Just in this little mm -hmm. comment. The real frontiers are between top and bottom. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's also very difficult to say nowadays, like, well, what's Israel or what's the US? Because the state since Reagan and Thatcher has been so deregulated, like Professor Hall coins the phrase the privatized terror economy um, in, in, his, in his book. And I think that, that that's a, a valid point. Like when I use the generalization Israel, I mean, I'm not talking about everyone in Israel or it's, it, you know, even the Israeli state, it, what is that nowadays? Because with, with this privatized terror economy, it's very, very, we don't get a pretty picture. And I, 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 I do agree that that makes our, our quest for the truth very complicated. Actually, if, if I can just add to that, um, I would have to say that I agree wholeheartedly with the horizontal picture that Professor Herrett has just described. And I just wanted to mention a little bit about um, my colleagues uh, in public administration policy who have been studying this. And uh, Lance DeHaven Smith, several years ago, coined the term state crimes against democracy. And what he's referring to is not political differences between uh, groups such as Republicans or Democrats. He's talking about public officials who have been elected or so-called elected to represent the people and they are actually circumventing or deconstructing laws to benefit themselves. So here again we have people who are in control at uh, some of the higher levels and that they are purposely using that power to um, orchestrate um, events, uh, elections, um, foreign policy, all kinds of things. And something I think that is really important to keep in mind is that um, we can investigate the events that led up to 9-11, um, and that's one of the things that uh, Lance Damon Smith is looking at, is that 9-11 is a key event in a pattern of events, which are state crimes against democracy. They have been occurring for a long time, they are still occurring, and they will continue to occur in the future. Now we can investigate 9-11 on its own, or we can investigate it um, linked to other crimes that it has precipitated. So for example, um, the Patriot Acts 1 and 2 being put into place immediately after 9-11, um, the War on Terror, the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, clearly crimes, and um, war profiteering. There, there, are, and there are many state crimes against democracy that have come from 9-11 that we can also investigate, and there are clear evidence for these things. May I yes. come in here and build on what Laurie has said? Um, she used the word investigate, and this is where I want to pick up the thread. We are involved in an international criminal investigation, as I see it. I'm talking about 9-11 now, although of course the same thing applies to every one of these other state crimes against democracy. And we don't have the apparatus of the state in, with which to do it, partly because we're saying the states are themselves corrupt and in some cases directly criminal. And the states have a monopoly on the police, the courts, the prison system, and so on. They are the ones who we normally expect to investigate criminal activities. They can subpoena witnesses. They can say, you have to come and tell us what happened and so on and so forth. We don't have that because the states are collaborating. They are implicated, it, sometimes through cowardice, presumably, and sometimes through direct and enthusiastic involvement. The economy. Yes, yeah. of course. So, here's the challenge. How do you do a non-state criminal investigation? And this is one of the reasons that universities are so essential. Any decent university will have many people in it from different disciplines who are used to carrying out investigation. And they know the difference between primary sources and secondary sources. They know what evidence is. They should know what a chain of reasoning looks like and a hypothesis and so on. And some will be architects and engineers, some will be chemists and physicists and neurologists. Some will be text scholars. Some will be historians. Where are the historians here? 
and so on and so forth. <laughs> well, there aren't very many doing this. No. Even yeah. the people who specialize in contemporary American history. And I know this because I, I assembled a bunch of journals of contemporary American history a year ago, and I, I went through the indices for about seven of them since 9-11, and not one of them contained a single article asking what happened on 9-11. There's a lot of postmodern uh, pirouetting around about what 9-11 means, but they weren't willing to ask, yeah, but what really happened and who did it? So, here's the point. Universities can be enormously powerful in helping with us with this non-state criminal investigation. You have people who spend their whole lives investigating. We could make the average criminal uh, investigating investigation team look absurdly weak. Uh, I don't care if it's the biggest investigation the FBI ever did. We can mobilize far more intelligence. But we need to have the will to do that. And we then need to get organized to do that. And uh, carry out a, a multi-track, meaning many disciplines, multi-track international investigation. So, and we have been doing and that. we've we've been doing it, but I mean the universities have largely been sleeping, and we're trying to wake them up. So I think it's far beyond sleeping. I mean, I think <laughs> it's far <laughs> more <laughs> dark. Can I can I bring it down to a real human level? Okay, several, a couple years ago when we first presented these papers at a symposium before they were actually published, we did get, I got one pointed question, and it kind of took me back at first, but it really speaks to where people's minds are at, and the gentleman said, okay, it's eight years later, why does it matter? And I could just feel my blood boil, because it matters, because there are people being killed every single day, they have been killed. Since 9-11, they are continuing to be killed every single day. And what's happening is that the mainstream media is not showing this. And if they were to show it, they were to show the devastation, the destruction, the war profiteering, what's really going on in Afghanistan and Iraq right now, the millions of people who have been killed, the um, millions of people who have been displaced into the countries around those areas, I think we'd have a different response. I think if it was in people's faces every single day, the destruction of humanity, that it would be a very different story. No, it, you, as you con contemplate this more and more, the, uh, the, the uh, implications of those who are silent, I mean, we, we, we're quite hard on Germans, for instance, who lived through what we call the Holocaust, uh, or uh, human tragedy and demonstration of the depths of depravity to which human beings can go. And we're quite hard on uh, those who say, hey, nobody told me about this. I didn't, my government didn't explain this to me at the time. In fact, they were giving me an interpretation that uh, I accepted. And uh, maybe even if I thought something was wrong, it might have been dangerous to say anything. Uh, we don't, we're not too sympathetic looking back in history to, f to earlier times. And, and, and when, uh, you know, you talk about people being killed, how many millions displaced in Iraq? <laughs> uh, how many tortures going on? Do we know that torture is taking place in Canada of Canadians? Do we know it isn't? I mean, there, there, is, there is no uh, end to uh, the um, uh, crimes against humanity. Let's think about that phrase, crimes against humanity, crimes against all of us. And do we keep silent because it's good for our careers to keep silent? I mean, uh, the, the, those uh, in the academy who have tremendous privileges, but with those privileges should go some responsibility. You know, when we walk into our classrooms, when we walk through our institutions, we get a lot of... Uh, well, we get a lot of respect. Okay. So, so the, this idea of keeping silent because it's not good for your career okay, to then. speak up, that time is, oh, this is 10 years. Mm -hmm. okay. and, 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 and those okay. of us, yeah. Then maybe we have to ask the public to help us. If our other academic not colleagues not won't, much. we need to ask the public to help us. So, for example, in Canada, universities are largely publicly funded. And that's by taxpayers' money. So that means that we owe them something back. We owe them a return on their investment. 
So why is the public, and this is what I tell people when I talk to them, I say that people in the community of which your university is, you should be going to the professors at that university and asking, why are you not studying this? Why are you not speaking out about this? Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, why, why isn't anybody in the academic world actually speaking out? Um, that's something that's really important. We have to get teachers and institutions of higher education everywhere concerned with this. In fact, uh, the uh, Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth website just came out with what they call a, oh, I think it was a, not a media package, but a it's an information package. They, they have a bunch of the 9-11 information on DVDs and printed out in sheets so that you can give them away left and right and they're real cheap. Oh, and I just heard David Chandler is offering up his DVD 9-11 uh, analysis with David Chandler for about a dollar twenty-five a piece when you buy them in a hundred lot. That's for the purpose of not resale but just dis distribution of the information. Otherwise, uh, he wants to be, you know, supported, you know, buy his DVD, it's $15. And by the way, they are a 501c3, the Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Um, so if anybody wanted to donate money to the 9-11 cause, I'd get a hold of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth because they are a 501c3 and you'd get a statement that you can take off your taxes. It's a little late for this year. Um, now, Niels Herrett waxes a little bit poetic here, but he's, uh, you know, trying to give people a little bit of encouragement. You know, we seem to be in, we're in the tenth year. Uh, we don't seem to be getting any closer to actual prosecutions except for Khalid Sheikh Oswald, I mean, <laughs> Muhammad. And, uh, so it can be psychologically, you know, debilitating. It wears you down after a while. You wonder uh, how much more of this can we keep doing? Well, we're going to keep doing it as long as we have to. But this one, uh, he com Niels Herrett compares the 9-11 event to the a terrible dragon in Beowulf or uh, other mythology. So go ahead and roll this one and see if you don't agree. We'll, we'll open up the phone lines for maybe four minutes when we come back. I think that no matter how you ad address uh, this present state of the global community, uh, it is all related to each other. It's all uh, it's all connected. And um, regarding 9/11, I one thing comes to my mind. The other day, I was having the honor and and pleasure of sharing a, a lunch with Professor Alvin Lee, who was former president of, of the McMaster University. And being an old man, he has he is a specialist of the Beowulf uh, saga, of which I am not too uh, well learned. So maybe Graham could help me a little bit about the Beowulf saga. It is about a man who kills a dragon. Basically, well, yes, he has to fight a couple of monsters before he gets to the dragon. He had to fight. He has to fight a couple of monsters before he gets to the dragon. <laughs> yeah. Grendel and Grendel's mother. Yes. Yes. <coughs> and I, I, I think this is a picture which is still, and this is from the fifth, uh, sixth century. I think so. Old, I'm sorry, Neil. But the picture know. still holds, mm -hmm. basically, uh, what we are here. We are fighting the dragon, and very recently, if I may draw a line to to a more contemporary uh, a piece of art, namely the Sleeping Beauty of Walt Disney, where where Prince Philip is coming to the castle and the beauty is sleeping up there. Her name is Aurora, but we could call her Democracy, and the dragon is to trying to prevent Prince Philip from liberating the uh, the princess. There are thorns all over it, and the dragons is there are fires uh, coming out of its mouth, and and the Prince Philip is coming riding on his white horse, which is called Samson. He has a little shield, he has a little sword. He jumps off his horse, and the, the dragon is still. She, it is throwing fire um, 
I'm filled. It is not going too well. The, the dragon is 10 stories high and Transfiddle is still moving backwards and it's not going too well. There are fires all over. In the end, he ends up in a little cliff over a huge canyon and fires is coming all over and the dragon is moving forward and Transfiddle is moving further, further and backwards with his little shield and his little sword and finally the dragon is going to deliver the last final blow and it bends back and reveals its soft belly. And Prince Philip throws his little sword. And 9-11 is the soft belly of the dragon. That's, that's what I said. Okay, 9-11 was the soft belly of the dragon. Well, you see right here, here, <laughs> I got to get one of those reverse flip-flop things so I can do like the weather people. Anyway, 503-288-444. Eight is the only number we have, and we're oh, we, we're just getting a call right now. Good work. Well, I wanted to point out that Jesse Ventura just came out with a new book. It's called "63 Documents the Government Doesn't Want You to Read," and uh, among those documents, they printed in its entirety the CIA assassination manual. There's a number of other things you should get the book. I'm going to go get it as soon as I can afford it. Anyway, go ahead, caller. Yes, thank you for another wonderful show. I just wanted to make a quick comment or a question. Go for it. Uh, you got professors against 9-11. You got architects. You got engineers. You got scientists, physicists. Uh, what about the uh, the legal experts? Yeah, there there's is. Any... There's lawyers against nine or lawyers for 9-11 truth. Really? Yeah. Okay, that's what I was just going to ask. Where are the lawyers and the attorneys and yeah, the prosecutors yeah. and judges? Who I've are the kind of like JFK, you know, the, the Jim Garrisons? I've been waiting for them to get active, and I'm sure that they are in the background, but uh, they they at least have a website. You can check it out, Lawyers for 9-11 Truth. There's a okay. whole bunch of for 9-11 truthers out there. Excellent. So they are filing lawsuits, civil lawsuits that you know well, of? Well, that I don't, getting, I'm not sure. I don't know. Because I haven't heard of any. Um, I know that individuals are, but I don't know if the, these lawyers in that group are involved in that yet. I know that they had a statement of uh, uh, purpose or a statement of solidarity with the 9-11 movement, and that might be as far as they went right now. Because I would say that that would be the way to go if they can get evidence to be put on record in a courtroom. Absolutely, uh, that's what I'm like saying. Jim Garrison did. That would be excellent. All uh, right, so Khalid, if you could do any future shows on that, on the on the any legal efforts on that. I definitely would that would be like good. You know, I, I know some lawyers. I'll see if I can find any. You know, well, the problem again is, would you, would you want to put your legal career on hold or or down the drain so that you could go after 9/11? That's politically what happens if you don't get anywhere. Or even if some of the family members, some of the uh, survivors of 9/11, if any of them filed any. Civil claims to get oh, any yeah. of this Actually, uh, they have. statistical evidence on record, really? Um, let's see, what was her name? Um, oh, she just filed a lawsuit against the Pentagon. Um, and really? It, and it was dismissed, though. Uh, let's see. Uh, but it was significant that it at least got that far. Yeah, to, okay, well, could, sounds good. Yeah, we're just about out of time. Shows on that. I would love that. Yeah, I'll try to get some of that information for the next show. That's May 7th. In the meantime... Um, and the website, Lawyers. Oh, Lawyers for 9-11 Truth. I All right, thanks a that, lot. That's Appreciate the, keep it up. Keep up the work. You bet, thanks. And, uh, yeah, we got nine seconds. See you guys later. <laughs> May 7th is the next one, folks. <laughs>